Thank you so much to the Mark Twain Library for hosting us today. Today, we're going to be talking about different types of connections and learn how health is connected by our brains, our social communities, and how we as individuals affect the health of our community. We have three speakers today who are all very excited to talk to you. We will first hear from Helona Dantes, who is a PhD student in the physics department at Yale. Helona does research on how living systems can be applied in the field of physics. A fun fact is that Helona has lived in three countries and has visited six. Next up, we have Jonathan Pertelet, who is a PhD student in the Department of Anthropology. Jonathan studies the behavior and genetics of owl monkeys, which are found in Latin America. His research takes place in both Argentina and at Yale. A fun fact about Jonathan is that his favorite primate is the ring-tailed lemur. Finally, we have Samantha Gillis, a master's student in Yale's School of Public Health, who studies the epidemiology of microbial diseases, specifically focusing on tropical diseases and vaccine development. A fun fact about Samantha is that she is a twin. All three speakers today are going to be talking about human health and how it is impacted by connections that lie inside our bodies and all around us. Connections are fundamental to life. We are made to connect with one another, connect ideas, and connect to our communities. This was made painfully clear when COVID struck. I found myself suddenly isolated from friends, family, and my community. Like countless others, I struggled with lockdown loneliness and mental health declines without those vital in-person bonds. Researchers have quantified COVID's traumatic impacts, Rates of depression and anxiety spiked over 25% globally. Clearly, our individual well-being fundamentally relies on being able to connect with others. As we'll see today, connections profoundly impact our health, whether the neural wiring inside our brains, the social bonds we form with each other, or the communal vaccine, or the communal immunity that vaccines create. Let's dive into the microscopic scale first. Those Neural connections in our minds, the intricate wiring of synapses shape our personalities, behaviors, even things like who gets depressed or anxious. Holona will map out these pathways that make us who we are. Zooming out, we need social bonds too. Though we view ourselves as individuals, our health and resilience relies on those around us. Jonathan will share how relationships help baboons withstand hardship. Finally, big picture, vaccine connections literally protect entire communities. One shot generates immunity, not just for that arm, but for community-wide immunity that emerges when access and trust exists. Samantha will explore how vaccine links keep society healthy. So now I'm gonna give it to Holona. Today, I will be talking about synaptic connections and how we can look at synaptic connections to understand human behavior. So I've, have you ever wondered about the mysterious gap between having a thought and then doing an action based on that thought? Perhaps the mysterious gap between touching a hot plate and then removing your hand from that hot plate because you burnt your hand, or the gap between thinking about reconnecting with an old friend and then sending a text or an email um, to contact that old friend or even the gap between reading a recipe for a dish and then making that dish. Today, I am going to talk about um, that gap, specifically the nervous system um, and how that gap connects our thoughts and connects our actions together. Um, for the purpose of today's talk, I am going to talk specifically about the connections in the nervous system. So what is the nervous system? The nervous system is um, a system that, again, can make, has connections from the thoughts. It consists of the brain, the spinal cord, and peripheral not neurons in the rest of our body. Um, the nervous system is pretty complex, but it can be um, broken down into discrete units. These discrete units are called neurons. 
So this, um, the purple and yellow diagram is, represents a neuron. Often when I studied new ner nervous system for the first time, my professor compared a neuron to a tree. But for the purposes of this talk, I think it's very interesting to compare the nervous system to a network of rubber bands um, connected by pins. And in order to understand how this network of rubber bands on this network of neurons can, um, affects our human behavior, it is interesting to look at what happens when you um, cut a rubber band and how does the rest of the rubber band take up the load of um, cutting that one rubber band. So in the nervous system, this looks this translates into something called neuroplasticity. So what is neuroplasticity? Neuroplasticity is the brain's capacity to change structurally and functionally um, when responding to a sim stimulus. This could look like um, responding to an injury and then rewiring the brain circuit that way. Neuroplasticity is manifested in different ways. One uh, way that neuroplasticity is manifested in is called structural plasticity. Where, we, where the structure of the neurons, or if we are using the analogy of the rubber bands, the structure of the rubber band changes in response to that injury. Another way is the functional plasticity, where we have different pathways in the neurons that uh, have different functions. So like assigning that function of that broken rubber band or that broken pathway to some other pathways is another way of the brain uh, participates in neuroplasticity. But for this talk, we are going to look at something called the synaptic plasticity or plasticity that is associated with synapses. And to truly understand what synapses are, it's important to understand that in our analogy, the synapses are the things that connect each neuron to each other. So in this case, it would be the pins. The pins are the synapses in according to our analogy. So just to give you a glimpse of what a synapse looks like before we continue talking about it. So the synapse connects each neuron to each other. And to truly understand what the impact of a synapse on our nervous system, um, I thought it would be interesting to give an ode to the past. So um, we have to go all the way back to 1873. Up till this point, the brain was known to have be made up of a network of neurons that were just connected and there were no gaps at all. Um, if we were to use a um, rubber band analogy, that would mean there were no pins and everything was just a network of one big rubber band. Um, but in, 1980, in 1873, a scientist by the name of Golgi developed a new way of looking at cells under a microscope. And that helped another Spanish scientist by the name of Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who discovered that the nervous system or um, the nervous system is actually made up of neurons, yes, but it also has some microscopic gaps called a synapse. And so that, uh, so synapses, just to recap, are just junctions, they're microscopic junctions between each neuron. And they're pretty important for communication because it's at those synapses, it's at those synapses where um, if the connection is wrong, if the connection doesn't go as planned, th that part can affect our human behavior. And so truly, and so to understand what happens at these connections, uh, for those of you who do not know, um, the neurons can communicate with each other using electrical signals. But if but as like in any circuit, if the if there's a gap between the circuit, um, the electric current doesn't go through. So how does our nervous system actually communicate with each other? How does the electric current go throughout the community to the nervous system through this circuit if there are gaps? And this happens uh, in this way. So the electric signal first is converted to chemical signals. Um, another name for these chemical signals is called neurotransmitters. Now the si chemical signals diffuse across the gap and then they reach the um, other neuron, the neuron that receives this um, signal. And so what happens here is that the chemical signals or the neurotransmitters are binded to receptors. 
So these receptors are pretty specific. They don't just bind to any neurotransmitter. They're pretty specific. So the information is relayed correctly. And those, and those chemical signals that the receptors receive is then again converted to electrical signal. So this is how an electric current, electric current basically is transmitted even with these gaps. Um, and just to make sure that everyone understands this, is the sp yellow spheres are the chemical signals and the, um, and the Z um, objects are the receptors. Now, what is synaptic plasticity? Now, just to recap, synaptic plasticity is another form of neuroplasticity. So um, it's when the synapses um, change in a way they change in a way to accommodate for the injury that happens in the nervous system. So um, one form of synaptic plasticity is called long-term plasticity. And that is what we're going to talk about in this talk. Uh, long-term synaptic plasticity is what it sounds like. It is related to, it has a more long-term change in the body. And then this the short-term plasticity where that has a more short-term change with regards to duration on the synapses. It was a uh, long-term plasticity, synaptic plasticity, was actually discovered in 18, 1973 when um, scientists were studying neural networks or neural pathways in the hippocampus of the rabbit brain. They noticed that when you quickly and repeatedly activate different neural pathways, in the rabbit brain, the synapses made them stronger. So the connection, the uh, signals were made stronger. So how does long-term plasticity do that? It can do this in three different ways. First, it can increase the amount of chemical signal or neurotransmitters released from the, um, from the outgoing neuron. Second, it can increase the number of receptors available on the in, in the incoming neuron. And third, it can increase or decrease the flow of current through the ion channels or through the neurons themselves. So now today we are going to look at what happens when these connections or the rubber, the, these connections become weaker than normal and what happens when they become stronger than normal. So to understand that, we will look at an example. And for this, we are going to look at Alzheimer's disease. So what is Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative disease and affects a lot of people in the world. To be specific, it affects 45 million people in the world. Alzheimer's disease usually begins with a decline in cognition and eventually leads to dementia, which happens in the later stages. Alzheimer's disease is pretty interesting because scientists are still understanding what really causes Alzheimer's disease, what's the root cause. But in, in doing that, they are um, understanding different ways of treating Alzheimer's disease. And actually, it's a pretty hard topic and would probably be a pretty hard topic in neuroscience. And so to truly understand um, Alzheimer's disease, we have to go back to the connections. We have to go back to the microscopic connections. That is, so Alzheimer's disease is caused by something called long-term depression, which is um, an effect that happens on long-term synaptic plasticity. This is uh, this happens when either the amount of neurotransmitter or the chemical signal is decreased, or the number of um, the number of receptors decreases, or there's a or the um, the electrical signal to the neuron is decreased somehow. And in Alzheimer's disease, this looks like this. You. Um, one model of the Alzheimer's disease, like I mentioned before, it's still being researched, it's still being understood, and it's not completely understood. So one um, one model is that the misprocessing of um, an alpha beta or amyloid beta protein, um, precursor protein, is misprocessed. And what is amyloid beta? Amyloid beta is just a normal soluble product from meta neuronal metabolism. Um, in simpler words, it's something that is released when a neural network is activated. It helps regulate synaptic functions in early life, but later in life, it can cause um, it can cause complications. One of those complications is that it forms 
um, formation of plaques in the synaptic gap. So it blocks, because of those plaques, um, the synaptic gap has a lower um, surface area or like the receptors are blocked. So not a lot of information or not a lot of chemical signal can be, um, can be diffused from one neuron to the other. Another way that um, this misprocessing can cause trouble is that um, the more soluble species that do not form plaques can also affect the way that the um, electrical signal is transmitted. So amyloid beta usually decreases, um, is known to decrease the amount of electrical signal that passes from one neuron to the other. And by doing this, it decreases the information or decreases the chemicals, um, the neurotransmitters that can diffuse. So these are the two ways that um, synaptic connections can, can um, lead to Alzheimer's disease. And since um, the synaptic connections are usually associated with learning and memory, this leads, this leads to dementia. Now, what happens when the synaptic connections are stronger than normal? What happens when, um, when you pull the rubber band too hard? And to understand that, we are going to look at a common example that is addiction. So what is addiction? Addiction in this, for the purpose of this talk, is just abuse of either alcohol or drugs. Addiction affects a lot of people. Specifically in America, addiction affects 19.7 million Americans. And to understand the uh, neural circuitry or the, um, the neural circuitry of addiction, we have to go back to the synapse again. So we looked at what long-term depression can do to your body. Um, behind the reason or the neural circuitry behind addiction is something called long-term potentiation. So it's the reverse of long-term depression. In this case, um, there's more neurotransmitter that's released or there are more receptors on the incoming neuron or the, um, the signal, the electric signal is increased. Now, um, in addiction, what happens is that since addiction is basically abuse to the synapses, um, addiction causes an increase in a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Um, I feel like a lot of people know about dopamine and they know dopamine as the happy chemical. It is the happy chemical and specifically it plays a role in pleasure, learning and motivation. And dopamine is also partly responsible for forming memories and learning and forming and learning from those experiences. So one can think of addiction as something that causes pharmacological insult to the synapses. In simpler words, addiction changes. Addiction causes change to the brain circuitry. Um, addiction often attacks the dopamine pathway and it causes these changes in the dopamine. Now the brain learns from the, and to understand how that works, here's this addiction cycle. So first, the brain learns from repeated experiences and repeated substance use, and then it makes synapse, and then it forms synaptic connections. It uses the plasticity to change synaptic connections in the brain circuitry. Then what happens is that it's these strong memories associated with drug use and newfound uh, the synapse strand causes individuals to seek drugs, and that's how you become addicted. Um, and the problem with these addictions, but problem with these long-term changes is that when you try to um, recover from addiction, a lot of people go back to being, go back to um, addiction, no matter how hard they try, and they relapse because their circuitry is perm not permanently, but long-term, there's a long-term change to it. And because of the uh, tolerance and because of the increased number of receptors, both tolerance and relapse continue the addiction cycle. Now, um, in the way that we've looked at how synaptic connections, what can go wrong, but what about targeting those synaptic connections? What about targeting those spins um, to make a good long-term change? And we can do that using therapy. 
So specifically for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to talk about CBT. It's called cognitive, um, cognitive uh, behavioral therapy, and it's a form of psychological treatment. And so therapy can uh, in, involves individuals learning new scoping strategies and addiction. It can lead to more increased memories and it can um, redirect those neural pathways to having um, to having more increased memories about good things as opposed to abuse. So we've, we've spoken about how internal connections affect our human behavior. What about external connections? And to talk about that, I will hand it over to Jonathan. Hello, everyone. I am Jonathan Pertile, and I am a first year graduate student in the anthropology department at Yale. And I am going to be talking today about a different kind of connection from Helona, a social connection. And my talk is going to be about how social connections can help uh, baboons overcome adversity. So to get started, just like neurons, people are made to connect. And I am really interested in how uh, your own social connections affect you as a person. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of connections uh, for maybe you had a meeting at work today or you called your mom or you talk to your kid and all these social connections affect you and those around you. Not all connections are good though. When sometimes when connections go wrong, they can cause adversity, uh, especially in early life. In humans, there are three different broad categories of early lifetime adversity. And you'll notice that most of these have to do with when connections go wrong. Uh, for example, abuse and neglect and household dysfunction these connections have really bad, profound effects that we as uh, people interested in improving human health want to minimize. So we want to research the effects of adversity. Unfortunately, researching the effects of adversity in humans is quite difficult for a few reasons. One of these reasons is that humans have really long lives. So understanding the effects of early childhood adversity on later life, many decades, years later, is quite difficult. Another reason, observing human behavior is quite difficult. Most people are not very appreciative if you follow them around all day and uh, see what they're doing. So we have to depend on things like self-reported measures of adversity and behavior, which are not always as reliable as we would like them to be. Uh, and finally, human society is very complex with lots of confounding variables. We have things like racism, we have money, we have sexism. These things complicate our society and make it hard to understand the effects of adversity on uh, health. So can primatology save us from these problems? Primatology is the study of primates, our closest relatives. Primates include animals like lemurs, uh, monkeys, and also apes. Uh, humans are a kind of primate. We are an ape. By studying our closest living relatives, we can uh, get a better understanding of our own society as well. For this talk, we are going to be focusing on the baboon. Baboons can be a good model for social connections and adversity because they live in very social groups. Uh, they have from 20 to 60 individuals. They have complex social relationships with uh, matrilineal, so uh, based on their mom's uh, social statuses. And the baboons that we are going to be discussing live in Amboseli National Park in Kenya. We know that sociality is really important for baboons. One quick example of this is that uh, one kind of being social is for baboons is grooming. And the more that baboons groom, the more social they are, the less ticks they have. I'm sure you can imagine uh, in your own life how being social might help you. I hope you don't have a hundred ticks on you, but uh, we know that being social is really important for these baboons. And these baboons have been studied since 1971. And this makes them a really good model for the kinds of questions that we want to ask about how adversity and sociality connect. 
uh, because we can follow them for many generations. These are, in fact, been studied by multiple generations of women scientists uh, who have been interested in these questions for a long time. And because of that, we have data that we can use to answer questions. So what does early childhood adversity look like in a baboon? Ambicelli researchers have developed six indices of early lifetime adversity for baboons. The first one of these is drought in the first year of life for a baboon. You might think of this as something like uh, poverty or food scarcity because drought causes there to be not a lot of food for the baboons while they're developing. Another index would be large group size at birth. When the baboon troop has too many individuals, there is not enough food to go around for all the individuals. So there's a lot of competition. So again, you can think of this as kind of a equivalent of food scarcity. Having a low status mother is also an adverse uh, condition for a baboon because having a mom who can support you is uh, going to be really valuable for these baboons. Once again, and similarly, a poorly socially connected mother is going to help you get things like more grooming that are going to help you as a baboon. Finally, or additionally, a close in age sibling is another mouth to compete with and uh, another uh, individual to compete with, with not just for food, but also attention from mom, which is very crucial for the baboon's development. And finally, the loss of a mother is obviously an incredibly uh, profound uh, event for baboons and for humans as well. We know that this early lifetime adversity is really harmful for baboons. Baboons that face more early lifetime adversity generally die earlier than their counterparts with fewer lifetime adverse events. If we look at this graph, on the horizontal axis, we have age and years. So as you move to the right on this graph, uh, the, the baboons are getting older. And on this vertical axis, you have the proportion of baboons that survive to at least five years that are still surviving at any one of these ages. So this blue line represents baboons that had zero adverse conditions during their first few years of life. And you can see they tend to survive for a pretty long time. A large proportion of them survive well into their 20s um, before all finally passing away by the time they're 30. But the baboons that had three or more adverse conditions who had a very difficult early lifetime do not survive nearly as well as the ones who uh, face lots of adverse events. Uh, if you look at this red line, you can see that the line drops very rapidly and the baboons do not survive as long. So we have a pretty good understanding that baboons that face more early lifetime adversity die earlier. And dying earlier is obviously not good for a baboon because uh, the fewer years you survive, the fewer offspring you will have, and the this will affect how able you are to pass your genes on to the next generation. So here on this graph, you can see age, in, age at death on the horizontal axis and the amount of surviving offspring on the vertical axis. And uh, the longer baboons live, the more surviving offspring they have. And this is pretty tightly correlated. This is a strong relationship. We know also that social connections impact baboon longevity. Remember earlier we looked at the ticks? Well, that's just a small part of the picture because baboons that are better connection not only have fewer ticks, but they also survive longer. Here, again, we have age on our horizontal axis and the proportion of baboons in a group that are still alive on the vertical axis. This blue line represents the top quartile of baboons uh, with respect to how socially connected they are with other baboons in their troop. And this red line represents the baboons that are not as well connected in the bottom quartile. And you can see that the uh, blue line, the better connected baboons are surviving longer than the bottom quartile of socially uh, connected uh, baboons. And if we want to know if adversity can impact how uh, 
uh, the social connections and survival in baboons, we need to know the relationship between early life adversity and the social connectiveness of baboons. Because we know that the social connections positively impact survival. We know that for every increase in uh, a measure of social connectedness, the baboons gain on average 2.2 years to their life. But if they had early life adversity, then uh, their survival decreases by on average 1.43 years. But if early life adversity negatively affects social connections, then we wouldn't be able to have this big of effect. But research has shown that these two measures, early life adversity and the strength of social connections, are largely independent. They don't affect each other. So this means that the strength of social connected uh, social connections can actually offset the effects of early life adversity. So the big takeaway is that a young baboon that faced great hardship can overcome uh, their early lifetime adversity by being well integrated in their community. So social connections can actually offset the effects of early lifetime adversity. And this is really, really important for us to understand because early lifetime adversity in humans is very widespread. 64% of humans experience at least one form of adversity and 17% experienced four or more. With these uh, being so widespread, it's really important that we learn how to minimize their effects, especially because they disproportionately impact already marginalized groups, especially groups like Native Americans, LGBTQ plus people, people from low-income families, and many other groups. So researching adversity can help us better understand how to help those that face early lifetime challenges. And by starting this uh, research with baboons and then translating it to humans, we get a much deeper fundamental understanding of how early lifetime adversity and our social connections interact with each other. So, I hope from my talk today, you've learned that your community through your connections has profound effects on you. But now we're left with the question, how do your connections affect your community? And to do that, I want to give the floor to Samantha. So thank you. All right, hello everybody. My name is Samantha Gillis. I'm a master's of public health student at Yale School of Public Health, studying the epidemiology of microbial diseases. And today I'm here to talk to you about the effects of vaccine hesitancy on community health. So you've heard about how our own choices can affect our health and how our health can be impacted by our communities, but it's really important to understand how our personal cho choices can impact community health. Have you ever gotten sick? Has anyone in your community or household ever gotten sick? If you've answered yes to either of these questions, the decision of whether or not to get a vaccine should be very important to you. So first, let's talk about how the body responds when it encounters a pathogen. A pathogen is an organism that causes disease in its host, such as a virus, a bacteria, or a parasite. When the immune system encounters a pathogen, such as the one shown here, measles, chickenpox, and the flu, it, it creates molecules known as antibodies that work in two ways. So our immune system first recognizes the pathogens and it uses its memory to do that. And then the second type of antibody that is created is an antibody that fights off the pathogen. So you have one that recognizes it using memory and one that fights it off. If our body has never been exposed to a pathogen before, our immune system starts to fight it off and then creates these memory antibodies. So the next time we encounter it, we can fight it off much faster. Unfortunately, not all, not everyone's immune system works the way it should. Some people are immunocompromised with things like HIV. And when they're exposed, their immune systems don't fight off pathogens as effectively. And that often causes much more severe illness. So if you've ever heard of people who have to, you know, stay away from people, if, if people are sick because they will get really sick, it's often because they're immunocompromised. We also lose immune memory over time. So those immune and memory antibodies can decrease for the pathogens that we've already been exposed to if we're not re-exposed to them. And eventually we could have so few antibodies to a pathogen that when we encounter it in the environment again, it can actually make us sick. So as we talked about on the previous slide, our immune system fights pathogens that can make us very sick. 
Vaccines work by introducing our body to the same pathogens that would make us very sick if we were exposed in the environment, but in a really safe and controlled way so that when we're exposed to them, or that, that same pathogen later, we've already built up our immune defenses so we can kill it and attack it before it makes us very, very sick. And there's a couple different types of vaccines that I wanna talk about today. They vary in the ways that they're made and who they can be given to and how often we can get them, which is why there are different types of vaccines. Today, we'll talk about the two most important types of vaccines and a third type that's been recently developed and is now in use. So the first type of, path of vaccine we're going to talk about are live attenuated vaccines. So these are made with weakened forms of the pathogen after the pathogen has been uh, passaged met for many, many generations. So we raise them in a lab and our immune system, when introduced to those, that those weakened pathogens can create these antibodies once we get this vaccine. So because live and attenuated vaccines are only weakened, they create a very strong reaction. And that's why we never really need boosters for these vaccines. So the measles, mumps, and rubella, the MMR vaccine, and the chickenpox vaccine are two really, really common examples. You only need them once in your life. And for this reason, because they're, they create a really strong immune reaction, they can't be given to people who are immunocompromised or to infants who don't have fully developed immune systems. So only these people, the ones that are super healthy, can get these vaccines. Our second type of vaccine that we're going to talk about are inactivated vaccines. These are made with a dead pack pathogen. So live attenuated are weakened pathogens, inactivated are dead. And even though the pathogen is dead, the body is still able to recognize it as foreign material and create those memory antibodies. So when we uncover, encounter it in the wild, we're able to fight it off. These are much safer for all people, even those who are immune compromised since they're completely dead. So why wouldn't we make all live attenuated vaccines into inactivated vaccines? Because they're safe for everyone, right? The inactivated vaccines stimulate an immune response that's a little bit weaker than live attenuated vaccines. This means that the number of memory antibodies in the body will decrease much faster. And in order to supplement this, we often have to get boosters of inactivated vaccines. This is the reason why you may have to get boosters of something like the Tdap vaccine for tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis every 10 or so years. And the final type of vaccine that we're going to talk about today is a new type of vaccine, but one that may allow us to create vaccines for many pathogens that we can't yet vaccinate against. And this would be mRNA vaccines. These take a small amount of the genetic material from inside a pathogen and introduce that genetic material to the body. When it enters the body, the immune system can use this genetic material, <clears throat> excuse me, to create these memory antibodies to fight it off. And the great thing about mRNA vaccines is that they can be given to anyone, including infants, elderly, and immunocompromised people. And we're able to change them very, very quickly to adapt to mutations. This is especially important for viruses like SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID virus, which is able to evolve really quickly. So we can change the genetic material that we're introducing to the body in order to gain some immunity using the vaccines, even though the virus itself is evolving very rapidly. And as I'm sure many of you know, the very first mRNA vaccines to be produced and distributed were the Pfizer and Moderna COVID-19 vaccines. We have to continue getting boosters because it, they change so, so quickly. And staying up to date on these boosters ensures that our immune systems have those memory antibodies that can recognize and fight all forms of the and all versions of the COVID vaccine or pathogen, all of the different strains. So next, let's talk a little bit about disease spread from person to person and really get back into how our health affects community health. So let's go through the disease timeline. First, you're healthy and disease-free. We call this stage susceptible. When you're susceptible and you interact with someone who is sick, you become exposed. From there, the pathogen can multiply inside your, inside your body, and in turn, you can spread it to more people. We call this stage infectious. Eventually, your body will successfully fight off the pathogen, and you'll no longer be able to spread it to others, and we call this stage recovered. So the number of people that you spread the disease to depends on how infectious a certain pathogen is. 
The scientists that study disease spread are known as epidemiologists, and epidemiologists use math to show how likely it is for disease to spread or how infectious it is. The most important number in epidemiology is called R0, or this R sub zero that you can see on the screen. Every disease has its own R0 or R0 range that can tell us how the infectiousness of a pathogen. So we can translate R0 as the number of susceptible people that a single infectious person can infect before they recover. So an example above shows that the R0 of Ebola right here is about two. This means that the average person who has Ebola will spread it to two other people. It's really important to know that it is not a, a stationary number. It can range a lot. So it, and that can mean that, you know, on average, somebody could spread it from anywhere from 12 to 15 people or 12 to 18 people. And that this R0 number is really influenced by individual behavior and actions of infectious people, and they can increase or decrease the likelihood of transmission. So if we didn't know how COVID spread and no one was ever able to wear masks when exposed or before they were vaccinated, then the R0 for COVID or coronavirus would be could be much higher. But because we know that wearing a mask helps eliminate the spread, the R0 is much lower. And this is really important because it emphasizes the agency we have in preventing our communities from getting sick. We can really take precautions that protect those around us, and that's super important. So this is just showing us how the number of people can change depending on the infectiousness of the disease. So we have here, mumps is very, very contagious. Measles is also very, very contagious. And this means that on average, a measle, one person who has measles can spread it to 18 other people on their own. So as we've now discussed, each disease and pathogen spreads at its own unique rate. We also know that the ways in which vaccines work to prevent disease within ourselves, but why does our choice to get or not get a vaccine matter to the health and well-being of our communities? When enough people in the community are vaccinated or immune, it protects the rest of us who are still susceptible. So this introduces a concept called herd immunity. Herd immunity is resistance to disease spread within a population caused when enough individuals have immunity after recovering from a disease or after being vaccinated against it. So here in this picture, we see that one person who's infected can spread it to a ton of different susceptible people. But in this picture, we see that there are so many people who are immune because they've either already recovered from the disease or they were vaccinated against it. And so the number of people who it can be spread to from an infected person is much, much, le much, much less. So vaccination offers protection in several ways. First, as we just discussed, it makes the likelihood of contracting a disease much less likely. Second, even if you do contract a disease after being vaccinated, the likelihood that you develop very severe symptoms is much lower. And people who have mild symptoms often are often less likely to spread disease because they have less pathogenic material inside of them. So if a large portion of the population gets a vaccination it's, it, and is immune to a certain disease, it makes it much more difficult for that disease to spread in a population, even if a few people remain unvaccinated. So recall some of the reasons people may not get vaccinated, as we talked about when describing the types of vaccines. And this could include people with immunodeficiencies, such as HIV, or people who are too young or old and have weakened immune systems that can no longer handle the vaccine material. There's a lot of good reasons why someone may choose not to get vaccinated. And it's really important to understand the implications of these choices to make sure each person is making the right and informed decision for themselves and their communities. So the fact that herd immunity exists is proof that choosing to vaccinate yourself can really help protect your community members. So you may be thinking to yourself, well, Samantha, most people I know have gotten all of their recommended vaccination. So how big of an issue is vaccine hesitancy really? It's actually a really big issue. And unfortunately, we're seeing trends pointing to increased rates of vaccine hesitancy worldwide especially following the COVID-19 pandemic. As of 2022, 20.5 20 
million children had not had all of the routine vaccinations, and over half of those had never been vaccinated at all. In the U.S., we have requirements for students to get the routine vaccinations before entering school, but some states allow exemptions for various reasons. It could be religious, personal beliefs, or medical inability, once again, due to immune deficiencies. And the number of exemptions that have been requested over this past school year, the 2023-2024 school year, has doubled, that is double that that was requested in the years leading up to the COVID-19 pandemic. So over 90% of these vaccine um, exemptions were requested for non-medical reasons. So not for people who were immune deficient or perhaps allergic to some components of the vaccines. And increased hesitancy happens because people are really scared of not knowing what vaccines are made of and because some va vaccines have adverse side effects. And it's really important to know that all vaccines undergo a really rigorous approval process that takes years and they're continual, continuously monitored to ensure they're safe and effective. Once again, it's always important to be informed about every medical choice that you make for yourself and for your family. So consulting your doctor is always a good step if you're unsure whether or not you want to get a vaccine. So let's talk about how much vaccines actually help. And they help a lot. Every year, vaccines save 4.4 million lives. And between 2021 and 2030, vaccines are estimated to save over 50 million lives. Not only do immunizations save lives, they also save us a lot of money. So what does this look like for the everyday person? You know, because we're pretty healthy and we have a lot of health resources at our fingertips in the U.S. So what does this look like? Well, every sick day costs the average American $277. If you're a member of a family or if you or a member of your family, such as your child, were to be infected with a disease like measles or chickenpox or COVID, it would take you out of work for nearly two weeks. Two weeks of missed work taking care of yourself and others can cost up to $4,000. This includes the cost of medical care, child care, and the lost product productivity at work. So it can actually cost you a lot of money if you aren't getting vaccinated and staying healthy. So what are some future concerns? If these trends in vaccine hesitancy continue, we're going to have a lot of problematic effects on individual and community health. The first of these is antimicrobial resistance, which is maybe something, a term that you've heard before, but this is when pathogens no longer respond to the medicines or vaccines we use to treat and prevent them. This can happen when a lot of people don't get vaccinated and then get sick. The more people who can host a pathogen or have it inside of them, the more likely the pathogen is to mutate and evolve, the more opportunity it has, and then it, it may no longer respond to the vaccines and treatments that we have available. Vaccine hesitancy is also affecting veterinary medicine. So just as much as human medicine, recent trends have shown that pet owners who are hesitant to vaccinate themselves are also less likely to vaccinate their pets. Unfortunately, dogs and cats and other common pets have pathogens that can be transferred to humans. And this is known as zoonosis or zoonotic cases, which happens when humans get sick from animals. We, if we don't vaccinate our pets, there are opportunities for pet diseases to evolve and gain the ability to infect us as humans and make us very sick. So this here is just showing, oh, the dog has some sort of sickness and it, he can pass it on to his human and that would be really bad. So let's look at some community outbreak investigation. With decreased rates of vaccine uptake worldwide, we've begun to experience outbreaks of diseases that were considered eliminated a few years ago, such as measles, mumps, chickenpox, and polio. This past December, there was a measles outbreak in Philadelphia. Also in December, there was a huge outbreak of chickenpox in inner city Chicago. Additionally, there have been surges in the number of swine flu and influenza and COVID-19 outbreaks that have been observed in the past year due to lack of immunizations. So in the past vaccine, you know, if we haven't been able to get vaccines or if we choose not to get vaccines, we see outbreaks of things that really haven't happened in the US for a long time. And this can be attributed to vaccine hesitancy. However, in the past, some vaccine campaigns have been very, very effective. 
Thanks to the polio vaccine and positive vaccine uptake in the U.S., we've only seen two cases of polio in the U.S. since the year 2000. So almost 25 years and only two cases of polio. This is proof that vaccines can really help eliminate devastating diseases. Our choices impact the health of those around us. And this isn't always a bad thing. We can either help protect or infect our communities, depending on the choices we make. So let's do our part because we're all in this together. At the end of the day, the two public health practices and interventions that save the most lives every year are hand washing with soap and vaccinations. Remember that vaccines don't save lives, vaccinations do. From neural networks to our personal relationships to our community interactions, connections are all around us. We are humans and we're made to connect. 